the Oxford Bookworms Library. Stage 4. A Tale of Two Cities. Chapter 6. Stormy Years in France. In Monsieur Defarge's wine shop in Saint Antoine, customers came and went all the time. They came to drink the thin, rough wine, but more often they came to listen and to talk and to wait for news. One day there were more customers than usual. Defarge had been away for three days, and when he returned that morning, he brought a stranger with him, a man who repaired roads. Madam, Defarge said to his wife, this man, who is called Jacques, has walked a long way with me. One customer got up and went out. This mender of roads, continued Defarge, who is called Jacques, is a good man. Give him something to drink. A second man got up and went out. The man who repaired roads sat down and drank. A third man got up and went out. Have you finished, my friend? said Defarge. Then come and see the room I promised you. They went upstairs to the room where Dr. Manette had sat making shoes. The three men who had left the wine shop were waiting. Defarge spoke to them. No names. You are Jack One, Jack Two, and Jack Three. I am Jack Four. This is Jack Five. He brings us news of our poor friend Gaspard, whose child was killed by the Marquis' coach a year ago. I first saw Gaspard, said Jacques Five, holding on under the Marquis' coach as it drove into our village. He ran away. But that night the Marquis was murdered. Gaspard disappeared and was only caught a few weeks ago. The soldiers brought him into the village and hanged him and they have left his body hanging in the village square, where the women go to fetch water, and our children play. When Jacques Five had left them, Jacques One said to his friends, What do you say? Shall we put their names on the list? Yes, all of them, the castle and all of the family of Evremonde. Is the list safe? asked Jacques too. Yes, my friend, said Defarge. My wife remembers everything. But more than that, every name is carefully knitted into her work. Nothing can be forgotten. A few days later, Defarge reported to his wife some news from his friend Jacques in the police. A new spy has been sent to Saint Antoine. His name is Barsad, John Barsad. He's English. What does he look like? Do we know? He's about forty years old, quite tall, black hair, thin face, said Defarge. Good said his wife. I'll put him on the list tomorrow. But you seem tired tonight and sad. Well, said Defarge, it is a long time. It takes time to prepare for change. The crimes against the people of France cannot be revenged in a day. But we may not live to see the end. Even if that happens, replied Madame Defarge, we shall help it to come. 
but I believe that we shall see the day of our revenge against these hated noblemen. The next day, a stranger came into the wine shop. At once, Madame Defarge picked up a rose from the table and put it in her hair. As soon as they saw this, the customers stopped talking, and one by one, without hurrying, left the wine shop. Good day, madame, said the stranger. Good day, monsieur, said madame Defarge. But to herself she said, About forty years old, tall, black hair, thin face. Yes, I know who you are, Mr. John Barsad. Is business good? asked the stranger. Business is bad. The people are so poor. Madame Defarge looked over to the door. Ah, here is my husband. Good day, Jacques, said the spy. You're wrong, said Defarge, staring at him. That's not my name. I am Ernest Defarge. It's all the same, said the spy easily. I remember something about you, Monsieur Defarge. You took care of Dr. Manette when he came out of the Bastille. That's true, said Defarge. Have you heard much from Dr. Manette and his daughter? They're in England now. No, not for a long time. She was married recently, not to an Englishman, but to a Frenchman. It's quite interesting when you remember poor Gaspard. Miss Manette has married the nephew of the Marquis that Gaspard killed. Her new husband is really the new Marquis, but he prefers to live unknown in England. He's not a Marquis there, just Mr. Charles Darnay. Monsieur Defarge was not happy at this news. When the spy had gone, he said to his wife, Can it be true? If it is, I hope that Miss Manette keeps her husband away from France. Who knows what will happen, replied Madame Defarge. I only know that the name of Evremond is in my list, and for good reason. She went on calmly knitting, adding name after name to her list of the enemies of the people. Time passed, and Madame Defarge still knitted. The women of Saint Antoine also knitted, and the thin, hungry faces of Jacques and his brothers became darker and angrier. The noise of the coming storm in Paris was growing louder. It began one summer day in the streets of Saint Antoine, around Defarge's wine shop, with a great crowd of people. A crowd who carried guns, knives, sticks, even stones, anything that could be a weapon. An angry crowd who shouted and screamed, who were ready to fight and to die in battle. Friends and citizens, shouted Defarge, we are ready to the Bastille. The crowd began to move like the waves of the sea. Follow me, women, cried Madame Defarge. A long, sharp knife shone brightly in her hand. We can kill as well as any man. The living sea of angry people ran through Saint Antoine to the Bastille, and soon the hated prison was ringing with the noise of battle. Fire and smoke climbed up the high stone walls, and the thunder of the guns echoed through the city. 
four terrible and violent hours. Then a white flag appeared above the walls, and the gates were opened. The Bastille had been taken by the people of Paris. Soon the crowds were inside the building itself, and shouting, Free the prisoners! But Defarge put his strong hand on the shoulder of one of the soldiers. Show me the North Tower. Take me to 105 North Tower. Quickly! Follow me, said the frightened man. And Defarge and Jacques Three went with him through the dark prison, past heavy closed doors, up stone stairs, until they came to a low door. It was a small room, with dark stone walls, and only one very small window, too high for anyone to look out. Defarge looked carefully along the walls. There! Look there, Jacques Three! he cried. A.M., whispered Jacques. A.M., Alexandre Manette, said Defarge softly. Let us go now. But before they left, they searched the room and the furniture very carefully, looking for small hiding places. Then they returned to the crowds below. The Bastille and its officers were now in the hands of the people, and the people wanted revenge and blood. At last, it has begun, my dear, said Defarge to his wife. It was the 14th of July, 1789. In the village where the Marquis had lived, and where Gaspard had died, life was hard. Everything was old and tired and broken down. The people, the land, the houses, the animals. In the past, everything and everybody had had to work for the Marquis, and he had given nothing in return. But now, strangers were travelling about the country. Strangers who were poor like the people, but who talked about new ideas ideas which had started in Paris and were now running like fire across the country. The road mender, who had brought the news of Gaspard to Paris, still worked repairing the roads. One day, a stranger came to him as he worked on the road outside the village. Jacques, said the stranger. He shook the road mender's hand, and turned to look at the Marquis's castle on the hill. It's tonight, Jack, he went on quietly. The others will meet me here. It was very dark that night, and the wind was strong. No one saw the four men who came quietly to the castle and said nothing. But soon the castle itself could be seen in the dark sky. The windows became bright. Smoke and yellow flames climbed into the sky. Monsieur Gabel called loudly for help. But the people in the village watched and did nothing to save the castle where the Marquis had lived. Chapter 7 A Call for Help The troubles in France continued. The citizens of France had fought to win power, and now they used it. Castles were burned, laws were changed, and the rich and powerful nobles died, their heads cut off by that terrible new machine of death, the guillotine. In Paris, the king was put in prison, and in 1792, the people of France sent him to the guillotine as well. The French Revolution was now three years old, but there were more years of terror to come. Not all the rich nobles had died. Some had escaped to England. 
Some had even sent or brought their money to London before the revolution began. And Telson's bank, which the French emigrants used, had become a meeting place where they could hear and talk about the latest news from France. One wet August day, Mr. Lorry sat at his desk in the bank talking to Charles Darnay. The years since Charles's marriage had seen the arrival of a daughter, little Lucy, who was now nine years old. Dr. Manette had continued in good health, and at the centre of that warm family circle was always Lucy, a loving daughter, wife, mother, and a kind-hearted friend. Even Sidney Carton, though his old bad ways were unchanged, was a family friend, and very much a favourite with little Lucy. But at this moment, Charles Darnay was trying very hard to persuade his old friend, Mr. Lorry, not to go to France. It's too dangerous. The weather is not good. The roads are bad. Think of your age, he said. "'My dear Charles,' said the banker, "'you think that, at nearly eighty years of age, I'm too old? "'But that's exactly why I must go. "'I have the experience. "'I know the business. "'My work is to find and hide papers "'that might be dangerous to our customers. "'And anyway, Jerry Cruncher goes with me.' He'll take good care of my old bones. I wish I could go, said Charles restlessly. I feel sorry for the people in France, and perhaps I could help them. Only last night, when I was talking to Lucy... Talking to Lucy, repeated Mr. Lorry. You talk about your lovely wife at the same time as you talk about going to France? You must not go. Your life is here, with your family. Well, I'm not going to France. But you are, and I'm worried about you. Just at that moment, a bank clerk put an old, unopened letter on Mr. Lorry's desk, and Darnay happened to see the name on it. The Marquis of Evremond, at Telson's Bank, London. Since his uncle's death, this was Darnay's real name. On the morning of his wedding to Lucy, he had told Dr. Manette, but the doctor had made him promise to keep his name secret. Not even Lucy or Mr. Lorry knew. We can't find this Marquis, said the clerk. I know where to find him, said Darnay. Shall I take the letter? That would be very kind, said Mr. Lorry. As soon as he had left the bank, Darnay opened the letter. It was from Monsieur Gabel, who had been arrested and taken to Paris. Monsieur wants the Marquis. I am in prison, and I may lose my life because I worked for a landowner who has left France. You told me to work for the people, and not against them, and I have done this. But no one believes me. They say only that I worked for an emigrant, and where is that emigrant? Oh, monsieur, please help me, I beg you. This cry for help made Darnay very unhappy. After the death of the Marquis... He had told Gabel to do his best for the people. But now Gabel was in prison, just because he was employed by a nobleman. It was clear to Darnay that he must go to Paris. He did not think that he would be in danger, as he had done everything he could to help the people of his village. He hoped that he would be able to save his old servant. That night... Charles Darnay sat up late, writing two letters. One was to his wife, Lucy. The other was to her father, 
Dr. Manette. He told them where he had gone and why, and he promised that he would write to them from France. He had left secretly, he wrote, to save them from worrying. The next day he went out without saying anything to them of his plans. He kissed his wife and his daughter and said that he would be back soon. And then he began his journey to Paris. When he arrived in France, Darnay found that he could travel only very, very slowly towards Paris. The roads were bad, and every town, every village, had its citizens with guns who stopped all travellers, asked them questions, looked at their papers, made them wait or threw them in prison, turned them back or sent them on their way. And it was all done in the name of freedom, the new freedom of France. Darnay soon realised that he could not turn back until he had reached Paris and proved himself to be a good citizen not an enemy of the people. On his third night in France, he was woken by an official and three other men with guns. Emigrant, said the official, these three soldiers will take you to Paris and you must pay them. Darnay could only obey. And at three o'clock in the morning, he left with three soldiers to guard him. Even with them he was sometimes in danger. The people in the towns and villages all seemed to be very angry with emigrants. But finally they arrived safely at the gates of Paris. Darnay had to wait a long time while officials carefully read his papers, which explained the reasons for his journey. One official, seeing Gabelle's letter, looked up at Darnay in great surprise, but said nothing. Another official asked roughly, Are you Evremond? Yes, replied Darnay. You will go to the prison of La Force. But why? asked Darnay. Under what law? We have new laws, Evremond, said the official sharply, and emigrants have no rights. You will be held in secret. Take him away. As Darnay left, the first official said quietly to him, Are you the man who married the daughter of Dr. Manette? Yes, replied Darnay in surprise. My name is Defarge, and I have a wine shop in Saint Antoine. Perhaps you have heard of me. Yes, my wife came to your house to find her father. Why did you come back to France? It will be very bad for you. Darnay was taken to the prison of La Force and put in a cold, empty room with a locked door and bars across the windows. He thought of Dr. Manette and his many years alone forgotten in the Bastille. Now I, too, have been buried alive, he thought. <laughs>